is renewing the debate over sanctuary cities and border security. Here to discuss, Ben Shapiro, editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com, syndicated columnist and host of The Ben Shapiro Show, and Adrian Elrod. She was a director of strategic communications for Democrat Hillary Clinton. Good to see you both tonight. You too, Shannon. All right, I want to read a little bit of uh, the reaction that we have from the ICE deputy director tonight. He says this, it is unconscionable that politicians across this country continue to endanger the lives of Americans with sanctuary policies while ignoring the harm inflicted on their constituents. Following the conclusion of this case, ICE will work to take custody of Mr. Garcia Zarate and ultimately remove him from the country. Adrian, he's come back five times. This will be number six. How will it be any different? Look, there's no question that in, the, in this particular case, the system at the federal, state, and local level absolutely broke down. Um, I still can't wrap my head around this verdict. I think a lot of people that as are trying to unpack uh, what actually happened and, and how the jurors came to this conclusion. But look, local law enforcement in cities that are so-called sanctuary cities will say that having an ongoing dialogue with the immigrant community in their cities is what actually makes it safer. So as a political pundit going on a television show, I'm cer certainly not um, going to question what local, local law enforcement think and how they want to govern their communities, but that is what they say. And um, you do see crimes that are lowered in sanctuary cities among the in immigrant community compared to some cities where they feel that they cannot communicate with law enforcement. All right, Ben, what do you make of that argument? I mean, I live in Los Angeles, and I can tell you that the idea that making sure that, that illegal immigrants continue to be released back onto the streets rather than being given over to the feds, uh, that is not going to lower the crime rate. The, the lack of trust between the immigrant community and the law enforcement community, that needs to be overcome. But that's not, that can't be overcome by simply saying that illegal immigrants should be released back into the community rather than being handed over to the feds. I mean, in this particular case, this guy was a repeat criminal many times. If you've been a citizen of the United States, here in California we have a three strikes law. If you are convicted three times in felony cases, you end up in jail for a very, very long time for life. In this particular case, this guy was convicted of a bunch of different crimes. He was deported over and over and over again. He was set free by sanctuary cities that refused to coordinate with federal law enforcement. He was out. He picked up a gun. Uh, he stole a gun, presumably. Uh, and then he shot Kate Steinle, whether he did it, uh, you know, wh whether he, he meant to shoot her or whether he just meant to discharge the firearm is of no consequence. When you pick up that gun and you know that it has the possibility of firing and it fires, then this is at the very best involuntary manslaughter. Well, and, and, but not according to this jury. Uh, they said uh, not guilty on that count as well. Adrian, um, do you get how this uh, topic was such a good one for President Trump when he was running, why it resonated with so many people, uh, and, and why uh, just this one case alone really captured the nation's attention that this is an issue, these sanctuary cities letting people go, um, being very permissive with illegal immigration. Um, do you understand what he tapped into there, why people were so responsive to that? I, I do. I do understand what he tapped into, but I also think it's an absolute shame that he used this case time and time again as a political football uh, when this, the family of Kate has gone through so much tragedy and so much heartache, and to have this used in any sort of political way by the president of the United States during the campaign when he was running as a candidate, now as president, is a real shame. But look, this is a very yeah. complex issue, and I think what's it important to understand here is that this is one incident. What we've got to do is figure out how to handle the 800,000 dreamers who are living yeah. here in the United States allowing them to live in limbo, allowing a lot of the immigrant community to wonder what's going to happen to fear deportation every single day. All right, I got to bring so, in Ben here really quick because we're out of time. Ben, quick response from you. The basic notion that an illegal immigrant can commit crimes in this country and then re-enter the country at will is why President Trump won and it's why President Trump ought to push for the construction of that barrier and ought to make sure that the American people are safe from predators like this one. We will expect to hear more from the White House on this. Uh, ben and Adrian, thank you both very much. Thanks thank for coming you. out. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I know we, you mentioned the uh, ICE speaker who came in and got protested out, but yes. what are your, uh, what's your particular stance on the way we handle undocumented immigrants in this country? Because I'm aware that they aren't U.S. citizens, they don't have constitutional rights, but they are still people and we should treat them with respect and they have human dignity. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so let me start from this premise. My view on immigration is almost entirely libertarian if they're in a welfare state. So my view on immigration is that free flow of labor is a good thing, uh, but there are two mitigating factors. Mitigating factor number one is you can't come here to take advantage of the welfare systems. Uh, and mitigating factor number two is you have to accept the culture of the United States, which is to say the rights that are expressed 
uh, in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, which means a small government not guaranteeing bigger services through re redistribution of income. Uh, but you know that we don't have to. Uh, people come here to work. We don't have to give them the vote either. I mean, as long as you're coming here and not committing a crime and you just want to work, I don't really see that as being a particularly big problem. As far as people who are undocumented and violating the law to be here. The biggest problem, as I see it, is again twofold. One is taking advantage of the welfare system, uh, and there is a net cost for people who are coming here illegally because they take advantage of the education system, for example. Uh, they take advantage of state systems. It's still forbidden to get federal welfare, but there are state systems in California where I live. There are tremendous state support systems for undocumented immigrants, illegal immigrants. Uh, and, uh, and so here's my view. The government has every right to decide who comes in the country and who doesn't come into the country. That is true for new immigrants, it's true for people who are already here. If you come here and we feel that you're a net benefit to the citizens of the United States, you're coming in here and you are going to work hard and fly right and you're going to be a great addition to the United States, you respect our view of, of human nature and of government, and you just want to be part of this great mission, then more power to you, come on in. Uh, the same thing holds true for undocumented immigrants. Just because you've been here for 10 years, if you've been, if you've been Relying on welfare, uh, then I think you ought to go. If you are not a net benefit to the United States, you ought to go. A citizenry gets to say who gets to join and who doesn't get to join. Uh, and you know, if that is, if that means that there's a father and a mother, and the father is a bad addition, but the mother is a good addition, then they're going to have to make a family decision as to where they live, just like we would have to in any other family situation. Um, but it seems weird to me that the government can go through 150 million tax forms every year that the government doesn't have the power to go through 11 million applications from illegal immigrants, interview people, and decide who's going to add to the country economically and culturally and who's going to detract. So in other words, do it on an individual level. The big problem is that you have people on both sides who don't want to do it on an individual level. They want to say, okay, all undocumented, all illegal, I don't use undocumented because that's a euphemism, all illegal immigrants out. Okay, I think that that's silly. There are people who are illegal immigrants who have been here working hard and doing the right things, um, but there are lots of people who haven't and people on the left who say, everybody should stay because they've been here and they're just like us. Well, not everybody is just like us and we should take that into account. And my question was more or less, what is the reason why there's such a disproportionate amount of single mothers in the African-American poverty, like in that realm of... Because, okay, so the, the real reason that there's a lot of, of single motherhood in the black community uh, is because single motherhood has increased tremendously across all communities. So it used to be that in 1960, 5% of, of white women were single mothers. Today, it's 40% of white women. So all across, it's, it's increased. Single motherhood in the black community has been a bigger problem than in the white community because, yes, of pathologies of slavery. Um, that goes all the way back to, you know, it, back in slave times, the, the, the rate of single motherhood was really high because of forcible separation of families, and that carried over uh, into Jim Crow as well, although it was beginning to decline, actually, um, in the 1950s, in the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, with the explosion of welfare, uh, which was directly targeted at low-income communities, which happened to be disproportionately minority, now there was an actual economic incentive to continue uh, in, in pathologies of single motherhood. Uh, that if you were thinking about getting married before you had the baby, now maybe you didn't think quite as hard about it because after all the government was there to pick you up. And so the single motherhood rate continues to rise at a very high rate, but it's rising similarly at a high rate in the white community too. So I don't want to pretend it's solely a black problem, single motherhood. It isn't. There's a very high single motherhood rate in the black community, high rate, high rate in the white community, high rate in the Hispanic community. That's mainly because of the sexual revolution and the ideas from the left that a child doesn't need a, mo a mother and a father, and that there's some sort of inherent virtue that attends to being a single mother, which is really an irritating thing. There's a lot more virtue that attends to being a responsible mother, marrying dad, and then there being two parents there to help raise the kid. It's a, it's a source of never-ending annoyance to me that the way the popular culture treats disparate situations is that my wife, who's responsible enough to get married, wait a few years, have a job, have kids, that that in the in the heroism pantheon it's uh, she is secondary to the to the girl who decided to get pregnant out of wedlock at 19 and live in poverty like that, that just doesn't make any good decisions should be rewarded by society Th those mistakes cannot be unmade by society just by handing people checks because all that does is prolong the pathology so what you really do have to do uh, is help as you have to have family members that help you out, you have to have a social network that helps you out, and that's going to be rebuilt over a course of time. It's not, there's no immediate solution. If I, I'm not going to pretend that I have an immediate turnkey solution for a single mom who made a lot of mistakes, is living in poverty, and now I'm going to turn her into a millionaire overnight. I can't do that. The government can't do that. No one can do that. The government can't take my money and give it to her and make her wealthy. The government can't take your money and give it to her and make her responsible. Okay, the fact is that individual decisions matter. Okay, hey Ben, my name's Andrew, and since DACA's been making a huge headlines,
throughout the whole nation, what do you think should we do now? Should have been repelled? Should have been? Should should they have made it something else better, or should we continue having DACA? I'm sorry. What was the, the, the... DACA? Oh, DACA. Okay. So uh, okay. So first of all, um, you know, my my position on immigration is. I'm actually very libertarian on immigration, except for two factors. One is government payments that go to illegal immigrants, and the second is the, is the cultural assimilation issue for people who come across the border illegally and aren't willing to assimilate into traditional American culture. Right? So these are two serious concerns. I'm not as concerned with the economics of illegal immigration in the sense that people who say we have to restrict our labor force in order to maintain a certain wage base, I don't think that's correct, because this is why you see companies that actually offshore and outsource, because they're looking for cheaper labor. It's, it's always bewildering to me when conservatives say, well, we have to maintain a wage base by restricting the labor supply, then why aren't you for raising the minimum wage? That does exactly the same thing. It restricts the, the labor supply and raises the wage base. So as far as DACA goes, my, my view on DACA is that people who are here illegally, whether they were born here or whether they were uh, brought here as small children or not, should be assessed on a one-by-one -one, uh, judgment. So I am not in favor of the blanket swath amnesty for millions of people based on how long they've been here. I'm in favor of looking at people one-on-one -on -one and saying, okay, this person's in college and looks like they're going to have a career and hasn't been taking welfare dollars. This person looks like they're, they're a good American or they want to be a good American. Put them in the back of the line on a pathway to legalization. But if you're here, you've taken welfare dollars, you're not going to school, you're not bettering yourself, you're not going to be a productive part of American society, you haven't imbibed basic American cultural hallmarks, you do that, you should go. I have the exact same standard for people who are currently here illegally as the people who want to enter legally. I have the same exact standard, except if you're here illegally, you go to the back of the line, you wait behind the people who came here illegally. Yes. All right. Thanks, thanks for answering the question. Right. Special final to my friend Corey. Hi, Ben. Howdy. Howdy. Uh, I want uh, my question. It's a little bit hard to articulate for me, so 